Hello everyone and welcome back to my Mars colonization series in Kerbal Space Program 1.6.1. In this episode we're going to have a bunch of launches for Mars because it is the Mars window. And in this case it is one of the Phobos superlanders. Basically it's a Phobos lander with uh, ISRU unit and drills so that it can replenish itself. Uh, chances are it'll actually work and get to Phobos is minimal I think, uh, but we'll see. Uh, this time it's a Hydrolox version, that's why it's H2, and so it's using the Blue Moon uh, lander stage with the capsule on top and all. Because after all we don't need a whole lot of thrust to land on Phobos, the main deal is to capture and rendezvous with it. And uh, taking a look at the Delta V here, uh, it's got 1238 meters per second inside of it. So, you know, if we capture properly it's enough. If we don't capture properly around Mars, it's not. It is a heat, uh, one of the inflatable heat shields in order to help with capture. We will see how that works out. So yeah, this is the Gita Super Heavy, as you can see. Obviously, if we need to make the lander more robust, we can get a bigger lander stage. I mean, the thing about the Blue Moon larger size, there was the larger size variant of it. It's tall. And for Phobos, that's not too big a deal. But for other locations, I'm not too thrilled with it being tall. Uh, because I have a bad tendency to tip things over. So, yeah. We'll have to think about that. Whether I want to model that or not. But, uh, yeah. If we end up needing a little bit more Delta V, then we could use a larger rocket, obviously. We, we now have our options. Of course, we, uh, we could still use the... Sajita super duper heavy with the six boosters. But I think this will be enough for this transfer window. So it is the 50th anniversary of Apollo 12. Um, the launch was today and uh, the landing will be in a few days. And it's certainly the most fun to listen to as far as I'm concerned. And so I was listening to it while doing x 11 videos. If you see my um, Around the World in 80 Planes series on YouTube, uh, during that series I'm listening to the, uh, to the Apollo 12 audio, except I cut out all the silences so that I would flow better. Otherwise, it's very long, of course, and I, I didn't need that much audio. And so, yeah. If you want to listen to the original audio in a nice condensed format, but all of it, then that's a one way of doing it. Okay, we have core ignition. And we have booster separation. All is looking well. And we have fairing separation, so you see the lander. And I decided to add a supplementary Commutron 8888 on the nose, literally, because I sort of modeled the lander can, if you will, with eyes. That was the intention with the windows. And uh, so we have a nose there. And then uh, that would block these methane oxygen thrusters here, but it's not really supposed to use those very much. There are thrusters on the lander stage that face downward down here, and those should be enough. Uh, yeah, the only question is boil off, but since we're not actually following the lander along its way, there technically won't be boil off. In principle, we have such tremendous amount of power with the large solar arrays to power the drilling units and everything that there's no reason why it wouldn't be able to limit boil off. Oh, I've got these antennas too. I didn't really need the nose antenna. Uh, it doesn't matter. We had so many antenna problems last time that... I'm not taking any chances, so we've got that one too, and it'll be all right. And uh, we have the inflatable heat shield, as you can see, drilling units. The ISRU unit is tucked in here. You can see start ISRU liquid hydrogen is what we'll want. This locks and everything. We just drill for ore and make that stuff. I uh, don't know exactly where we would be able to drill for ore on Phobos, so that's a good question mark. And fortunately, relocating on Phobos is really easy, though. So if we don't find ore in one location, it's just a matter of a few meters per second to get to a different location to drill for ore. 
if there's ore on Phobos at all, but I'm just gonna blatantly expect that, otherwise the whole idea doesn't work anyway. The These little canisters are actually food, water, and oxygen, nitrogen, and lithium hydroxide, so if a Kerbal wants to use this, they've got about 100 days with a full crew of four, so 200 days uh, all on its own, so yeah, uh, it could be a supplementary life support system for a fair duration. If we need one. Okay, first stage separation, second stage ignition, nozzle extension. Specific impulse is alright, but it's twitchy. I'll just SAS that. Sometimes it's not good to use SAS to correct that, but in this case I think it's alright. And we're in orbit. 4,426 meters per second left, so we've got a fair amount there. Shouldn't be any problem making a transfer, let me plot for it. Okay, well, once again with Sujita Super Heavy launches, for some reason Smart ASS does not like to control it at this stage. It was, of course, a lot of wiggliness before, and once again at this point, it wasn't really getting it to the node. It's really weird, because it's the same stage. <laughs> I mean, th there shouldn't be any problems. Maybe there's some input lock thing that I have to clear, but anyway, I'm just steering it manually right now. So, uh, it looks like this will be arriving at Mars in 166 days. That's partly because we launched at a time when we didn't have... We we're not quite in the same plane as the other missions. So, we're ending up arriving earlier, I think. Okay. Let's see if it can hold node now. It's still very jittery. And yeah, it's not going to the node at all. No, forget it. I don't know why that is. Okay, trying to follow the node. And shut down. Alright, let's see what happened. We've got fuel to correct if necessary. It looks like we have an encounter. No, okay. Wrong place. Uh, we'll do that as a mid-course correction. So... And... Yeah, we'll have to have the stage tag along for a bit, but... Even if it boiled off quite a bit, it'd still have enough Delta V to do the mid-course correction I have in mind. So, we wanted our mid-course corrections to be around 87 to 89 days. So this is a little bit early. That'll do the trick. Really, probably at the mid-course adjustment, we might just use RCS. I don't know if the main engine is gonna be able to do it. I mean, because it's got 792 meters per second in 15 seconds. That takes a little bit of time to spool up too. We'll see. It can throttle a bit, but not a whole lot. So obviously we want to get uh, in the same direction as Phobos and Deimos. Well, Phobos. So that's this way around. Once we get there, we'll have to dip into the atmosphere, but this should be all right for the time being. So, add a new alarm, 88 days. We've got all the solar panels out. Let's get into daylight just for the heck of it. We've got the antennae out. Got food no way is going to be consuming. Nitrogen that is going to be consumed because that just leaks out no matter what. So that's a thought. We might have to replenish with nitrogen before Kerbals can occupy this, or they'll have to stay in their spacesuits. It's not going to be hugely comfortable anyway, but 
Yeah, we've got the radiators for the drills. All right, I think this is fine. So let's do the next launch. Okay, so our next launch is just a tug, but tugs are important too. If you recall, I launched a tug with the diamond-shaped docking port on the center line last time, and this time we're launching one with the NASA docking system, the one that Kerbals can pass through. So, once again, the Sujita Super Heavy is necessary to launch it because it's full of fuel. The tug, I mean, is full of fuel. So we need to make sure it's got a nice big launch here to get there. Again, this is roughly the capability of a Falcon Heavy, so keep that in mind. And once again, it wants to wiggle its plumes. The Kasei rocket is, of course, intentionally about the capabilities of a fully upgraded um, uh, super heavy booster, I mean, but I guess that's what we have to call it. Um, I'm talking about the SpaceX one, not the generic super, but it's complicated because they call the booster super heavy even though anyway. Um, or a Block 2 SLS, though that's probably not going to happen from the look of things. Okay, getting ready for core ignition. Well, just as I say that, we got core ignition. And I think it's okay. And booster separation. There we go. Okay, fairing separation and no big surprise, there is a tug. <laughs> No, no huge uh, innovations here. I'll get SAS back on there. We have first stage separation and second stage ignition, nozzle extension, wiggling, and good ISP. Okay, we have an orbit. We have plenty of delta V to transfer. The tug has locked fuels, so we're not uh, getting numbers based on that fuel. Extending solar panels. Okay, here we go for a transfer burn. Or not, sell the fuel down first. Okay, now let's go for a transfer burn. Gotta turn with the gimbling here. So of course between launches I'm still doing the ion engine burns with the Mars Transfer Vehicle 2. And I am sort of cutting it up and replotting as necessary in order to make sure that um, we do it as efficiently as possible without further corrections. Of course, I want to send as much backup to Mars as possible now that we've got Kerbals on the way. We either send it now or don't send it at all, basically. Okay, mission is on escape. The correction burn will probably be a little bit more than the previous one from the look of things. Alright, let me see what we can do about that. Actually, I was wrong. It turns out to be a bit less. 24 meters per second is the correction. And of course, we'll just leave this stage with it probably once again using RCS for the correction when we get there. Otherwise, it's not going to be precise. The tug has integrated comms, that's the dish on top there, and uh, we've got the solar panel re and electric charge shouldn't be a problem. Yep, definitely should not be a problem. Alright, so everything is off except for the RCS, and this is on its way. So, next launch. Okay, next up is a Mars Superlander, and whenever I say Superlander, I mean that it has an ISRU unit on it. So, in this case, we have an ISRU unit and large fuel tanks, it's methyl ox, methane and oxygen, and we're going to try and land it on Mars. It'll need par it has parachutes, obviously, and then drill for ore, convert it to methane and oxygen, and see if it can get back to orbit. That's a tough call, obviously, but it's something we eventually need to be able to do. And in this case, it's uh, on a Sujita Super Heavy. That's possible because 
I have to watch out for that flyby. Maybe the flyby wire thing was on and that's why they were all wiggly. Hmm, that's a good question. Because uh, the flyby wire hotkey is P. And so when I type Sajita, that makes sense. That's probably why it was messed up. Every time I type in Sajita Super Heavy into KOS, it'll activate the fly-by wire system with atmospheric autopilot and that'll interfere with Smart ASS and, uh, and KOS causing the wiggling. Let's see. I disabled it this time. Let's see if there's no wiggling this time. I should probably just get rid of atmospheric autopilot to be honest. Uh, we're not flying airplanes in this. Anyway, uh, I had to make a custom fairing for it because the tanks are abnormal. I'm actually using uh, SSTU Labs tanks for this one. And everything will be much clearer once the fairings come off, of course. But yeah, it's underfueled. That's how we are managing to launch it on a Sujita Super Heavy. It does not have all the fuel necessary to make it back into orbit around Mars. So, because it's underfueled, it's under the mass limit for this launcher to Mars. And then we'll land it on Mars. It has a little bit of fuel to land on Mars, obviously. And then it'll try to refuel itself on Mars using ore, and then get back to orbit. Uh, it might be clipping through the fairing a little bit. I don't know. That's some. I saw some weirdness with regard to the fairing. The fairing is as tight around the payload as I could make it. Uh, here, let me do some auto strutting just in case. I don't want any problems. Also, there was the matter of separating off the inflatable heat shields. In this case, I have put two separatrons. Now, the inflatable heat shield itself doesn't have a collider, so I can't put the separatrons directly on the inflatable heat shield. So instead, I put the inflatable heat shield on a separate decoupler. The decoupler has a, a hitbox a collider, and I was able to put uh, separatrons on that. They're sideways facing, so after it decouples, it should be pushed off to the side, hopefully. Um, we'll see. Good to test these things without any crew on board, of course. This is not the only version of a Mars Super Lander that we're going to launch over, though. Uh, we are going to launch one that is fully fueled, and that's to test the parachute capabilities to some extent. And, um... That will be launching on a Kasei rocket next. Nice clouds today. Well, it sure looks like that was the problem. It was atmospheric autopilot accidentally getting in the way of KOS. I clearly don't need SAS now, so it was a, a huge overlap of different systems. First we had KOS trying to control the rocket, then atmospheric autopilot was trying to override it. And then I enabled SAS to sort of combat atmospheric autopilot. It's like a huge battle between control schemes. Anyway, all right. Okay, we have core ignition once again. And we have booster separation. All nice and good. After testing some payloads with the Super Duper Heavies, it's become clear. Basically, the Super Duper Heavy was only necessary for the refueling in high orbit, which the Kasei launcher helped us with this time. Uh, mostly, we can get by with just the Super Heavy. Though, on the next launch, we'll be using the Kasei rocket just because I can. And I wanted to, I wanted to have it do a Mars launch. We've been sticking to the Sajita Super Heavy so far. Concerned that the fairings need to go. Didn't have the fairing staging quite right there. Okay, fairing separation actually managed to happen reasonably well, though the separation was a little bit suspicious. Maybe the payload was clipping into it. Anyway, this gives us an opportunity to talk about it. So you can see the inflatable heat shield, the extra decoupler there because I needed to mount the separatrons which are point which are pointed sideways a bit and downward you know still want it to go downward a bit 
and uh, we're using the ED5 packs. It doesn't have ED1 engines on it because it's too heavy for that. Partially filled, as you can see. Uh, the fuel tanks are SSTU Labs tanks with uh, 100 of the insulation, the MLI layers. Uh, the actual ISR unit is actually in the center because there's a hole in the midst of these tanks that it could fit in, and so there it is, the Convertitron 125. The drilling units are here. We still have the radiators on top, as you can see here. Uh, antennae, of course, uh, both drogue chutes and main chutes are available. And uh, supplementary battery pack, solar panel, oh god. I forgot that, well, uh, maybe we should lock the rotation. Oh, it doesn't seem to have that option. Um, the solar panels are gonna hit down there. Um, well, good thing that we don't have the same body collision or anything, but still that's distasteful. But anyway, hopefully we can sort of make sure that they always point that away and not do that. But uh, yeah, ideally they would be fixed in this case. And of course a ladder for the Kerbals when that time arrives, if that time arrives. Altogether it is 15 tons because this is underfueled. If it was fully fueled, as we will see with the Casse launch, it would be like 30 tons. It's carrying much less food, water, and oxygen, and nitrogen, and lithium hydroxide than the Phobos Superlander. I think it's only carrying uh, 30 days or something like that for four crew. So two months for uh, just two, if you want to use two crew. Okay, separation ignition. And we've got good specific impulse, nozzle extension. We're using the flat top version of the Sujita upper stage. Normally it has the payload adapter built into it, but this one does not, so that it could accommodate the procedural fairing. Okay, we have reached orbit. It looks like we have enough delta V to transfer fine, assuming it's telling me the truth there. Of course, whenever it is the number isn't in stage delta V, it always makes me wonder if something's being left out, but um, yeah, well, we'll see. All right, let me plot for Mars. Okay, smart ASS is doing what it's supposed to. Let me start setting the fuel down. We're a little bit late, actually. And ignition. And throttle up. Okay. Let's see what kind of correction we'll need to make. There's always a correction, of course. It's just, um, we're hoping not a very big one. And it looks like we have an encounter. We have an encounter that's in red, which means something else has happened. Um, are we encountering the moon? We are. We are passing by the moon. Okay, well that makes sense. Um, can we uh, turn off RCS because otherwise it's going to be fidgety along the way and I won't be able to see what's really going on. But alright, we're passing by the moon. Now I uh, took a look because we have our scanner around Mars already and um, it looks like there's a lot, well, I mean, there isn't a whole lot of ore around Mars, to be honest, or on Mars. But what there was, it seemed to be more Southern Hemisphere and Northern Hemisphere. We probably don't want to aim at the equator. Let me just show you the map here. Um, so this is the wrong resource. I was looking at a bunch of resources, but this is the resource map for ore. No really, you know, bright spots or anything. Uh, but we got ore concentration 2% down here. Equatorial is sort of choppy. That might just be because of the nature of the scanning, because part of the scanner is on a high orbit. But it's pretty definite when we get to lower latitudes. So basically 60 and below is pretty solid. And then some patchiness on 30 degrees south and below. Equatorial is a little bit more uncertain. Northern Hemisphere is definitely not good. So that's what we're looking at. It's still not a high concentration either way. Well, we want an inclination, so we're not going to aim for in line with Phobos and Deimos this time. Yeah, I think that'll be good enough. 
All right, so that'll be the mid-course adjustment, 16.7 meters per second. Let me just orient this uh, sun down so that we don't have the clipping issue. It'll probably mess things up and we'll have to replot once we get to the mid-course adjustment, but I'll add that timer to the alarm clock. And so what we have here is uh, MTV2. The only thing that isn't something going to Mars is the Mars transfer vehicle here, MTV1. That's coming back. But otherwise, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight right now. And we're going to soon launch number nine. Okay, the mission seems well situated to me. And yep, next up, our big launch. Now something I noticed when preparing this launch of the Kasei rocket is I decided to add MLI layers to this upper stage because it's going to be hanging out in order waiting for the transfer and I didn't want a whole lot of boil off during that time. Um, it's not strictly necessary but insulation layers are pretty light normally and as you can see uh, the difference between zero and up here doesn't seem to change our delta V very much. But then what I noticed was that suddenly once I got past about 80 MLI layers, it suddenly jumped, and in a weird way, uh, something I haven't seen with any other tank before. And so right around here at 85, uh, it hasn't really affected the dry mass at all. But suddenly I go to 86 MLI layers and above. First, first of all, it seems to be working properly after that. <laughs> For, I mean, I would expect it to you know, go, you know, basically 0.01 tons per notch, you know, something like that. And it should weigh like maybe a ton overall or something like that. That I wouldn't mind that. That would be fair. Um, but yeah, this jump between 19.76 tons, which is the state of dry mass of this tank, and suddenly going to 65.56 tons, that's strange. And that's an interesting number right there. Uh, that's an interesting number, but yeah, this is something wrong with the calculation ref uh, with regard to MLI layers on this tank. So I don't know if it'll do anything. It doesn't really matter much anyway. It was more of a mitigation thing. I'll leave it at 40 and uh, we're not going to have it hang out too much. But this time we're carrying a fully fueled Mars Super Lander in there. Uh, 34 tons as you can see. So yeah, we need... A fairly large rocket for that. So let's take it outside and see how it goes. Okay, so here we go. And we are launching immediately after the previous launch, and that's because of the moon. I saw it getting in the way of the previous launch, and I figured that if we tried to wait a whole day, that might cause problems. We might end up like smacking into the moon on Transmars injection or something. So we're gonna launch right now. And off it goes. So this will be the last launch of this episode, but I'll give you guys an opportunity to suggest things I ought to launch over to Mars. Tempted to do more fuel, but uh, if you have any ideas, you can go ahead and say so. And I'll uh, see about that in the next episode. Otherwise, we'll conduct the uh, mid-course stuff. Well, ion engine burns. Of course, I won't belabor that point. So I'll just do most of that off to the side and give you the result uh, but then make course adjustments and then reaching Mars we'll see when that happens but uh, yeah there might be something that I forgot about uh, I can contemplate surface bases that might be a thing but these landers are basically the same idea uh, so surface base modules maybe we could send some more maybe more robust ones launching on this perhaps it is a nice transfer window, so we do want to send as much as possible, but we've already got uh, nine things arriving, so... Anyway, nice to put this rocket to use. Okay, preparing for booster separation here. And off go the boosters. And throttle up on the core. So the reason why I was concerned about the MLI layers obviously isn't for this mission, but eventually I want to make a tank for Nerva or uh, nuclear thermal rockets, and that'll be based on this tank, except it'll be just the hydrogen tank, of course, not the oxygen part of it. 
so that really does need insulation to work. Well, I mean, I could uh, when I get down to the zero boil off stuff, I'll I could finagle some way of preventing boil off anyway. But um, I would like the emulators to work properly to mitigate how much uh, effort is needed to uh, keep the thing cool. And besides, it's realistic. But uh, yeah, something about the math doesn't quite work out. Maybe it's because of the size of the tank. But, oh, fairing separation. Ooh, those fairings. But yeah, there we go. It's the same thing except fully fueled. And the fuel is locked. So, yeah. Um, so just a little bit concerned about that. The, otherwise, the tank is configured the same way that the Sajita tanks are configured. So, I'm not too sure why there's a special problem here. But we'll see. Um, just putting that out there in case uh, other people might accidentally encounter this problem when making big rockets, you know, with the MLI layers. Keep an eye on those MLI layers to see if they're being added properly. Okay, now the huge nozzle of the vacuum version of this engine. And uh, we've got the gimbal limit limited to, to avoid the huge nozzle from clipping through the inner stage. Looking good. In fact, the engine's looking very nice and shiny and everything. If I do say so myself. Okay, making orbit and shut down. We do have plenty of Delta V, 4,200. The transfer is going to need about 3,600 or so. So we can carry more than this. Uh, it depends on the window though. 4,200, some of the transfer windows to Mars would require this. So um, the safe bet is to keep the keep the burden about 35 tons if you want to get it over to Mars. But anyway, let me plot for Mars and I'll be back with you with the transfer burn. Okay, well, I think we can ignite it now. We can throttle down if it turns out a little bit early. Ignition. The RCS ports on this stage are still not configured in a way that allows for turning very well, but at least they can sell the fuel down. They're still pointing through the center of mass. Okay, getting ready for the final phase of the burn here. Okay, well we can actually finish the burn with the RCS if necessary. Let's see how close we are. Interesting that it seems to be mostly changing the inclination. Alright, uh, we'll plot a mid-course adjustment. Okay, once again, we will uh, want to make sure that we have inclination so that we can reach those southern locations with the ore. And um, I don't really want to separate it because it'll create too much of an impulse. So we'll wait until the make course adjustment to actually separate it off of the stage. I don't think that'll be a problem, but maybe it'll be a problem. I'll activate the RCS up here so that it can turn. Um, but for now we can just keep that off and well let's see what the orientation is with respect to the Sun I mean there's a pretty big fairing base so it probably has a fairly powerful fairing the uh, fairly po powerful decoupler that I didn't tweak in the VAB so let's see Orientation wise that shouldn't cause any huge problems right now so I'll just have relative rotation to the Sun and hopefully it'll work out for us. Okay so there we have it. We'll leave it like that and we'll make sure that the alarm is in and it is. So okay with this being our final mission of the episode I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.